Okay, good afternoon uh, and thank you everybody for joining us. My name is Caroline Godkin. I'm the Deputy Secretary for Environmental Policy and Emergency Response here at Cal EPA. And this is the first meeting of the California Lithium Iron Car Battery Recycling Advisory Group. I endeavor to not say that too many times this afternoon because it is quite the mouthful. Um, so thank you to everybody um, on the advisory group who's joined us today. Um, and I will go ahead and take the role. So, uh, Anna Maria from Cal Recycle. And Mohammed uh, from DTSE. Uh, Mr. Terry Adams from SA Recycling. Yes. Uh, Mr. Dan Bowerson from the Alliance of Automobile Manufacturers. Present. Uh, Mr. Mark Caffrey from Umicor. I apologize if I said that incorrectly. Not here. Uh, Mr. Todd Coy. Present. Uh, Mr. Perry Gottesfield. Yes. And I apologize if I said your name incorrectly. <laughs> uh, Mr. Steve Henderson from Ford. Uh, Mr. George Kirshner. From, uh, I apologize, from the Richard Rural Battery Association. Uh, Mr. Bernie Cotlier. Uh, Ms. Jennifer Krill. Present. Mr. Nick Lapis from Californians Against Waste. Here. Uh, Ms. Alison Winder, uh, Linda from SCAG. Hi. Uh, Ms. Uh, Mr. Jeff Niswander. Present. Did I, did I completely mess that up? It was close. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps at the break I can get a primer on everyone's names. Uh, Mr. Lou Ramodetta from Surplus Service. Uh, Ms. Alyssa Reinhardt from the California New Car Dealers Association. And Mr. John Wiseman from Tesla. Present. Great. Uh, well, thank you, everybody, um, and particularly to those uh, joining us in the audience today um, and anyone who's joining us on the webcast. Uh, as I said, my name is Caroline Godkin, and I am the Deputy Secretary for Environmental Policy and Emergency Response here at Cal EPA. Um, and on behalf of Secretary Blumenfeld, welcome to Cal EPA, and uh, thank you for joining us. So some housekeeping items first. Uh, the restrooms are available directly outside of this room and to the left. Uh, in, an, in case of an emergency, obviously there's emergency exits in the back, um, and we will go directly to Cesar Chavez Park, located opposite the corner of the Cal EPA headquarters building. Uh, I would ask that uh, members of the advisory group, when you speak, if you could identify yourselves um, and use the microphone so that the webcast can pick up, pick up all of their comments. And uh, after each section and at the end of the meeting, we will uh, open up for public comment. Um, and for those viewing via the live stream, please send your comments uh, in the form of an email to the auditorium at calepa.ca.gov. And we will take a short break during the agenda because um, I know that everyone has other jobs and other pressing priorities. So we'll be sure to take some time for everyone to check emails and take care of business outside of the meeting. So thank you to everyone who's here today, particularly to the advisory committee members. Uh, you all applied to be um, on this committee and we are grateful for your time um, and your interest in being part of this committee for the next two years. Um, I would like to thank the UC Davis staff who are going to be supporting us in this effort going forward. And I would like to also particularly thank Mohammed Omar from DTSC and Teresa Bowie, who can't join us today from uh, Cal Recycle. They've done a huge amount of the heavy lifting in getting the meeting materials prepared and getting us ready for today's meeting. So thank you to them. Um, as I said, um, I am the Deputy Secretary for Environmental Policy. Under my purview uh, is uh, Cal Recycle and DTSE, so I provide policy support to the Secretary on those two areas. So obviously the lithium iron car battery recycling issues fall very much within that sphere. Uh, I was appointed by the Governor in September of this year, so I'm still very new, so uh, I ask for your patience um, as I get up to speed. Um, and previous to that, I was a Deputy Secretary at the California Natural Resources Agency. 
So with that, um, if we could, uh, maybe I will ask uh, each member of the committee to introduce themselves, um, what your interest is here today, um, and anything else you'd like to, to say. So I'm going to start at that end, if I may. My name is Bernie Cotlier, <clears throat> and I'm the executive director of the California Labor Management Cooperation Committee. I'm also a member of the board of NATBAT and of CalCharge. And my interest here is to ad advance the uh, recycling and, uh, and uh, most effective use of our batteries, and at the same time to reduce greenhouse gases and to uh, advance our state's energy policies. Afternoon. My name is Jeff Nicewonder. I work in the household hazardous waste industry. Uh, primarily, I'm interested in seeing as much of this material reused and recycled as possible. Um, electric vehicles are the hot new ticket these days, and I think they're only going to grow. So it's definitely a waste stream that we should be concerned about. Hi, good afternoon. I'm George Kirchner. I'm the executive director of PRBA, the Rechargeable Battery Association. Our association's been around since 1991, which seems like a long time ago, uh, when nickel cadmium batteries were the portable battery of choice. Um, since that time, our association has grown to include uh, all the major manufacturers of uh, lithium ion cells and batteries, uh, electric vehicles, battery recyclers, retailers, power tool manufacturers, a very diverse association that has a lot of interest in both portable batteries and these large format electric vehicle batteries. So our membership has a, a very keen interest in uh, the direction California goes with this uh, particular project. So I um, appreciate the opportunity to participate. My name is Terry Adams and I'm wearing two hats here. I'm with uh, SA Recycling, which is a large metal recycling facility operating <clears throat> three car shredding operations and about 35 um, auto dismantling uh, and metal recycling facilities in the state. I'm also a chairman of the board of Retrieve Technologies, which is a lithium battery recycling operations with uh, operations in Canada and Ohio. Uh, my name is Todd Coy. I'm the executive vice president of KBI. We are a facility located in Southern California and specialize in the management of batteries uh, like Terry. Uh, I'm wearing a couple of different hats. I, too, am uh, part of the NAPBAC group, uh, co-chair of their battery recycling committee. Uh, also, I sit on the board of uh, directors for the California chapter of ISRI. Uh, I'm also part of the legislative committee for that trade group. Uh, this uh, area of EV batteries, of course, is uh, <clears throat> impactful to the state of California, and we are interested to make sure that as this adoption rolls out that we are uh, in a position as a, as a state and also industry to manage these batteries as they come about. Great. My name is um, Jennifer Krill. I'm the executive director of Earthworks. We're an environmental organization that works to reduce the adverse impacts of extractive industries. I also wear two hats. I'm the chair of the board of Plug in America, another group that works, a nonprofit organization that works to speed the uptake of electric vehicles um, and has been working at that for 15 years. I'm here because I'm very interested in um, the end of life issues and making sure that battery manufacturing has the opportunity to maximize recyclability and minimize toxicity. Um, and that the impacts that we worry about where um, battery materials are extracted um, are not repeated or reflected in what happens with recycling. I'm very happy to be here today. Yes, uh, Perry Gottesfeld with Occupational Knowledge International. We're a nonprofit organization based here in California focused on occupational and environmental health. Um, I have been following the uh, growth of the lithium ion battery as it's gone from our pockets to our garages and uh, recognizing the challenges now for many years and looking at uh, the implications of this industry both in the U.S. and abroad. And uh, certainly I think this is uh, 
a great opportunity to explore some of the opportunities to uh, look at this industry while it's still relatively new and to look for some solutions to some of the challenges ahead. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mohamed Omer. I'm a uh, hazardous substances engineer with uh, DTSC. That's the Department of Toxic Substances Control here in uh, California. And my interest here is really to try, like so many other individuals here, to get ahead of what will be a very large uh, future waste stream and ensure that hazardous materials do not um, infect our communities, our environments, and our homes. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ana Maria Stoyan, Chu manager of the Electronic Waste Recycling Program with CalRecycle. Um, CalRecycle's interest in this advisory group is to promote an advanced reuse and recycling of EV batteries while also ensuring proper end of life management of these devices, of these uh, materials. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Allison Linder. Um, I currently work at Southern California Association of Governments. We're a transportation planning agency and we're heavily uh, facilitating communities in installing um, EV charging and just trying to, I guess, promote the proliferation of the EV market. Me particularly, I focus on the heavy duty side which is much newer, and so I see a great opportunity there to, um, to get in on the beginning as these technologies are being designed and manufactured and bring some of these uh, cradle-to-grave concepts into that process. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dan Bowerson, uh, I'm the Director for Vehicle Electrification and Fuels for the Auto Alliance. Uh, the Auto Alliance, for those that aren't aware, we represent 12 light duty uh, vehicle and truck manufacturers, um, about 75% of the new vehicle market. Um, as you know, automakers are continuing to invest billions of dollars in this area. And the reason I'm here and part of this board is we wanna make sure that these vehicles, as we continue to develop them, are very sustainable, both from the materials that we're using to the, uh, to the grave, to the portion of recycle and reuse. So thank you. Hello everyone, my name is John Wiseman. I'm representing Tesla, an electric vehicle manufacturer. Uh, I'm responsible for all of Tesla's uh, battery recycling programs globally. Um, Tesla being one of the uh, earliest electric vehicle, only electric vehicle manufacturers. Uh, we've, uh, we have good familiarity with uh, battery recycling uh, issues, needs and whatnot. Uh, our stated goal is to uh, reuse and get uh, as much recycled content into our batteries for production as possible. Um, so we're really hoping to collaborate on end of life policy so that we can achieve that. Uh, good afternoon, Nick Lapis with Californians Against Waste. We're an environmental organization based in Sacramento working on recycling and waste reduction policy. Um, we've helped set up a lot of the recycling programs in the state of California for a lot of different materials, whether it's you know the e-waste program or this uh, things like mattresses and paint and um, all sorts of other goodies. And in that vein, we want to see that uh, uh, these batteries get recycled, but also that the full cost of recycling these batteries at the end of life is uh, incorporated into the initial purchase price of the vehicles so it's not left to taxpayers at the end of the day. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, My name is Lou Ramondetta. I'm the president of Surplus Service. Our company is a, uh, I don't like to use the word recycling. We're actually a reuse company. About 85% of what comes into our facility is repaired, refurbished, and reused. Uh, we were the recipient of the Gila Award, the Governor's Environmental and Economic Leadership Award. Um, the reason I'm interested in this is I think we're a little bit behind the eight ball. We're already 10 years into this, so I'm a little bit frustrated that we don't have uh, some viable options out there from a recycling perspective. So I'm very excited to see that we're uh, looking at this and hopefully going to very aggressively go after some alternatives within the state of California for uh, both recycling and or reuse of batteries. 
Thank you and welcome. Um, so the, the purpose of today's meeting, this, as I said, this is the first meeting uh, of the advisory group that was created pursuant to AB 2832, which was passed by the legislature and signed by the governor in 2018. Um, the, the core requirement um, of that legislation was that for this group to develop recommendations to provide to the legislature to ensure that close to as, as close to 100 percent of as possible of lithium ion vehicle batteries in the state are reused or recycled at the end of life in a safe and a cost effective manner. So as you can see, we have a huge range of expertise and interest um, on the advisory group. Um, the, the legislation specified the specific members of the group. Um, and so you can see that's reflected in the composition of the group here today. Uh, the recommendations are due to the legislature in 2022, um, which feels like a long way away, but is two years. Um, it's going to be a significant amount of work for this group. Um, and I certainly look forward to working with you uh, in the next two years to create those recommendations for the legislature. So specifically for today's meeting, uh, we will discuss some more uh, details on the running of this group, uh, including a presentation on the, st the state's Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act. Uh, we'll provide some additional background um, on AB 2832. We'll talk about the content of the final report that we're working towards. Um, and then we will open it up for a discussion from this group on the current landscape for lithium ion. Again, there's a huge amount of expertise um, represented uh, here. Um, so I look forward to hearing that. So with that, um, are there any questions just on this introductory phase? OK. Well, with that, um, I would like to ask uh, Sawa Bojak to come up and present on the, uh, uh, the state's uh, Bagley Keen Open Meeting Act. Thank you. Hello, advisory group members. Thank you for having me. My name is Salwa Bojak, and I'm a, a staff attorney with Cal EPA, and I'll be presenting on the Bagley Keen Open Meeting Act. I provided each of you with a copy of the memo that I'm going to be going over and left a few copies for the public in the back. Uh, you may have seen a version of this memo before. This is an updated revised version, so I uh, recommend relying on this version. Um, and we can also send electronic copies for the members afterwards as well. So uh, the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act is a state law that requires multi-member state bodies established by statute to conduct their business in the public, except for limited circumstances that likely wouldn't apply to the advisory group. The Bagley-Keene Act represents a basic value judgment by the legislature that members of the public should have an opportunity to attend and participate in meetings of multi-member state bodies. So some of the general requirements of the Bagley-Keene Open Meeting Act is that they're open to the public, with advanced notice and an agenda of the items that will be discussed at the meeting. A meeting includes any congregation of a majority of the members of the state body at the same time and place to hear, discuss, deliberate upon any items that is within the subject matter jurisdiction of, of the body to which it pertains. A majority is more than half of the current membership. This is known as a quorum. Since this body is composed of 18 members, a quorum would be 10. Uh, and a meeting of at least 10 or more members would be subject to the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act. The same time and place normally means congregating within the same physical location or via teleconference or remotely or some combination of these methods. Uh, but I do want to caution members to avoid meetings uh, through non-conventional forums, such as social media. Uh, so to discuss a little bit more about public notice and what that means, um, state bodies that are subject to the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act must provide 10-day notice to the public, at least 10 days notice, and an agenda. The 10-day notice must identify the location of the meeting, as well as the location of members appearing by teleconference. The agenda identifies matters to be discussed, and any discussion at an open meeting are restricted to the items identified in the agenda. So it's essentially your roadmap as to what you're gonna talk about during the meeting. 
Any new topics that members want to discuss that are not on the agenda will need to be agendized for a future meeting. So to talk about attending meetings by telephone or by teleconference. Members may meet by audio or visual uh, teleconference or audio and visual teleconference for the members, uh, for the benefit of members and for the public. Uh, however, uh, if members are going to appear by teleconference, they must allow the public to attend at their teleconference locations. Um, therefore, teleconference locations must be publicly noticed and they must also be accessible locations to the public, such as through the uh, ADA requirements. And there are some other technical requirements such as posting your agenda at your teleconference location. Uh, so if members do intend to uh, participate by teleconference, just work with uh, staff early and we can help you with those details. Uh, now, uh, members may also attend remotely. It's a difference in language, difference in statutory language. Uh, but what this was a new law passed this year and it essentially allows members to meet remotely without actually disclosing their physical location and without meeting accessibility requirements or posting the agenda at their location. And this sounds really great, but there are other requirements <laughs> that go along with it. So special 24 hour notice to the public that you will be meeting remotely. Um, as well as providing the public with a remote conference line where they can observe or listen to the meeting remotely. Um, and there still needs to be a 10-day notice with a primary physical location where an actual quorum of the group will be meeting um, physically and where the public can attend and participate physically. So again, there are some various details about those requirements. So if you wish to attend remotely, you don't have enough time to post at your teleconference location 10 days in advance and are interested in this option, contact staff and, and we'll work with you on uh, working out those details. Now, uh, I will talk briefly about serial meetings. Serial me meetings uh, do not involve an actual congregation of the majority of the members at the same time and place, but uh, the meeting uh, results in a majority of the members communicating about the same matter. So outside of a me uh, meeting, in other words, members may not use a series of communications of any kind directly or through intermediaries to discuss, deliberate, or ta take action on any item of business uh, within the jurisdiction of the body. So one example is a series of separate telephone calls by one member to at least nine other members to discuss group business. That would create the quorum discussion. Uh, this is also known as hub and spoke communications. The person making the phone calls to all of the rest and communicating across members would be the hub of the wheel and the other members would be the spokes. So it's something to just be aware of and to avoid. Uh, another example is forwarding emails. So one person might send another person an email and that person might send it to someone else and they can see the cha chain of several people communicating and before you know it, you might have a quorum of individuals on the same email chain. So just be careful how you send emails or communicating with other members by email. Uh, and uh, I'm also gonna talk about uh, recognized meeting exceptions uh, where the group, uh, might congregate. So recognized meeting exceptions to majority gatherings um, uh, apply if members don't discuss group uh, business amongst one another. Uh, and this could be at a conference or similar gathering that's open to the public on topics of general interest, majority attendance at an open and noticed meeting of another government body, majority attendance at a purely social or ceremony, ceremonial occasion, and majority attendance at an open and publicized meeting organized to address a topic of state concern by a person or organization other than the state body. So in other words, if you will be attending um, a non-advisory group conference or a meeting of some sort that is open to the public, topics of general interest, and you're interested in attending, and you think some of your other advisory group members may be there as well, and you might have a quorum there, maybe 10 other members or nine other members are attending, just be aware that any communications amongst each other at that meeting might then become subject to the Bad Leaking Open Meetings Act. So try to avoid those communications about group business at other conferences um, to avoid any uh, bag leaking issues. 
Uh, in the memo that I provided you, I identify links to the act itself so that you can review uh, any provisions that you might be interested in looking at. I also add a link to the Attorney General's Guide to the Bagley-Keene Act, which is, can be very helpful to also help answer any questions you might have. This was also, I think, electronically distributed to you at some point as well. So, uh, and then finally, uh, the uh, last resource is that legal staff, me or someone else at Cal EPA, um, are available as needed if you have any questions or, or about any of what was discussed or the Bagley-Keene Act. So. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them now as well. Great, thank you, Sawa. Um, do we have any questions from the committee on this? Everyone's stunned. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I would just say that uh, Sawa's a fantastic resource and has been uh, incredibly generous with her time in, in getting this set up. So as questions come up, if you're uncertain of something, um, if you have a, a question on making sure that you stay within the, the right side of the act, please uh, just, uh, feel free to reach out to ask the questions. Um, it's always, I've found better to ask the questions um, to make sure that we're complying with the act. So thank you, thank you, Sal. Oh. Who should we reach out to? Or how do we get in contact with you? So in the memo that I provided, uh, if you look at the last page, it'll have my name, uh, my phone number, and my email address. So please feel free to reach out. If you have any questions, better to take them on ahead of time. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Great. Okay, so uh, with that, um, let's move on to the, uh, the, the next item on the agenda, which is a discussion of the roles, expectations, and procedural questions. Um, and I'm gonna hand over to uh, Mohammed Omar from DTSC to walk through that. Um, thank you, Dep Deputy Secretary Godkin, and uh, thank you as well to Salwa. I know we only had one question up here, but I'm sure many more will come up, so just be aware of that. Um, and hello, hello, everyone in attendance today. So my name is Mohamed Omer. I'm a hazardous substances engineer in the Policy Development Unit at the um, Department of Toxic Substances Control here in California. Um, in addition to, you know, as I said in my introduction, hopefully bringing to bear our institutional and departmental knowledge about hazardous waste and management as it relates to batteries, um, I also really have the privilege um, of being the facilitator for our meetings. So I'm going to talk about my role as well as uh, then the chair's role, um, and then kind of roles and expectations. Yes. And then roles and expectations for. Um, you know, just all of us up here, as well as uh, people in attendance. So the facilitator um, is someone who really enables the groups and organizations to work more effectively. So I'm gonna, my role is to try to contribute structure and process to our interactions with each other up here. Um, in this way, we will be able to function at a high level and to make high quality decisions. Um, as we all stated today in inter introductions, our decisions do have some you know, very serious weight moving forward with such an important issue. Um, so that is important. Um, I'm gonna try to really encourage full participation in discussions and promote mutual understanding among all of our group members. Um, you know, again, the, um, you know, in every group there are people who are you know, more outspoken and you know, some people who are quieter. So my goal is to try to really make sure that everyone gets a say. Um, also, um, you know, achieving consensus in disagreements or issues that may arise will also be a task of mine. So hopefully making sure that, of course, as disagreements occur, that they do not really derail our work. Um, and also distracting actions and behavior is going to be, you know, limited. That's a role of mine as well. So if there are, you know, uh, hopefully this never happens, but if there are kind of issues in the audience or up here on the dais, for whatever reason, we'll put a stop to that. Um, and finally, it's something that's very important and that Salwa touched on is that we have to follow an agreed upon agenda that will have been publicly noticed and keeping a clear record. And that falls kind of under my purview. Um, so a record will really be maintained in a couple of ways. So we are recording our meeting, and um, 
all of our subsequent meetings, including this one, will be made available online. Um, and detailed meeting minutes will be taken, reviewed, and posted online for public perusal as well. So today we have um, Emily from Cal Recycle, who is um, graciously taken on the role of taking minute, meeting minutes for us. And um, in the future, our meeting minutes will be conducted by our friends from UC Davis who are sitting over there. Thank you very much in advance. Um, and these meeting minutes will be made available to everyone up here. And before they get posted online, something that I will do is to send the draft to everybody to ensure that what is written jives with our mutual recollection of what is said. And then that will be posted online. Um, so the chair's role is different from that of the facilitator, um, a little different, but there is some overlap. So the chair will um, start our meetings on time and ensure that our work kind of conforms to our pre-existing and approved agenda. And this agenda is to be sent again to the group members in advance of each meeting. Um, the chair will then also cut close our meetings on time as well and summarize and note our achievements at the end of every meeting. And finally, the chair will really serve as the, the authority behind the facilitator. So again, this includes tasks of focusing our discussion, ensuring that um, we are on track to complete our tasks, um, encouraging and maintaining decorum. I don't foresee that being a problem, but that is a role. And um, also ensuring that all of our public interface is really conducted in a very respectful and orderly fashion. Um, expect expectations for all of us are that we would arrive on time, that we'd be prepared to discuss the meeting agenda. So we'll have read the agenda, read the background material ahead of time, that we will try and stay for the duration of the meeting. Of course, you know, emergencies do occur, but, you know, that is the expectation. Um, our cell phones, busy as we all are, will be on silent. Um, we're going to minimize distracting actions. And keep our commitments once made. So when we say we'll attend, that we try our best to attend meetings and so on. Um, and these expectations also apply to members of the public who choose to attend our meetings as well. So you know we understand that not everyone can stay for a four hour meeting, but if you're gonna leave to do so silently and uh, respectfully. <clears throat> um, and in addition to our procedures, during the meetings. Um, we will also have a procedural workflow in between meetings to ensure that you know, all of the advisory group members are kept aware of things that are going on, as well as the public. And so that workflow will generally involve, I'm gonna pull it out actually, um, just sending out meeting minutes ahead of time, ensuring that, um, that uh, topics for discussion are, are brought up by the advisory group members so that we have an agenda ready to go, um, ensuring that a quorum is available for each of our meeting dates, which will also involve discussion of meeting dates and making sure that people can attend them, um, coordinating our background material and research topics with uh, UC Davis, and they'll be doing a lot of that work for us, um, publicly noticing our events and holding these meetings. Uh, <laughs> So that's that as far as roles, expectations, and kind of our procedures. Um, are there any questions from anyone up here on the dais? Okay. Um, are there any questions from the public in attendance? And um, Audrey, are there any questions from the email? Okay. And I'd just like to remind folks watching from home or wherever you are that um, if you have any questions at any time, to please send them to auditorium at calepa.ca.gov. Okay. So now I'm going to um, discuss the bill itself a little more, and as well as kind of the recycling landscape that we have and our mission. Um, so Assembly Bill 2832 was enacted last fall, September 2018 to address rising concerns regarding lithium ion batteries and the eventual waste stream that they have already begun presenting and will present within the state. Um, recent estimates suggest that there are, you know, anywhere, anywhere between or above 400,000 to 500,000 um, electric vehicles in California, and that number rises faster and faster every year. Um, there's been 
about a 15% growth in electric vehicle adoption in this year as compared to last year in the state of California. So, you know, regardless of where the data comes from or, you know, where your stance is, one thing is very clear and, you know, is that California is leading the way in EV adoption and the responsible stewardship of lithium ion batteries in these vehicles will be absolutely critical from cradle to grave. So um, AB 2832 required the secretary of Cal EPA to convene this advisory group. Um, and it is to meet at least quarterly between now and April 1st, 2022, uh, in order to provide policy recommendations that will hopefully ensure that as close to 100% as possible of lithium ion batteries um, in electric vehicles are reused or recycled at their end of life in a safe and cost-effective manner. Um, so as Carolyn mentioned, and as you all heard from the introductions, um, this advisor group is composed of a very diverse group of individuals who are all bringing a great deal of expertise and um, you know, background and uh, differing interests when it comes to electric vehicles and electric vehicle batteries. Um, so beyond the state regulators, so Cal EPA, as represented by Carolyn, um, DTSC, represented by myself, and Cal Recycle, represented by Anna Maria, and then um, in the future by Teresa Bowie. Um, we are really lucky to have individuals from vehicle manufacturers, organizations that re represent them, um, electronic waste recyclers, um, automobile dismantlers, environmental organizations, representatives of the energy storage industry, um, and so on and so forth. And in addition, we will be consulting with universities and institutions that conduct research into this area as well. Um, now, our policy recommendations are really going to reflect entire life cycle considerations. So again, cradle to grave um, for these batteries. And this includes, but it really is not limited to kind of opportunities and or barriers to the reuse of these batteries as energy storage, for example, after removal from a vehicle, um, best management considerations for those batteries at the end of life, and also just the overall effect of different uh, management practices on the environment. Um, and we'll also be considering, you know, in-state and out-of-state options for battery recycling. Um, so as part of the preparation for this meeting, um, background reading materials were distributed and made available for everyone here today. Um, and this material introduced several topics. So there's a, there was an overview of battery technologies, recycling methodologies, some reuse cases, and the current, the current recycling regulatory landscape worldwide. So not just California or the United States, but also Europe, Japan, Australia, and so on. Um, so at this time, I'm gonna open up the panel for discussion regarding the bill, um, battery technology, recycling methodology, reuse, global regulations, um, and again, as well as the mission. So the mission, again, is we're to provide these policy recommendations that will again, attempt to ensure that um, we recycle as much as possible, uh, reuse or recycle uh, lithium ion batteries in a safe and cost-effective manner. So I'd like to open this up now to all of you. <clears throat> yeah, Dan Bowers from the Auto Alliance. Just a question, obviously by April of 2022 is when we make the recommendations. Is there any expectation of updates to the legislature before that? Uh, that's a great question um, and probably appropriate. Um, I'm not sure if anybody from Senator Darley's office is with us here today, but um, I, I think that is a, a great idea that we should be doing that in the interim. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, and one comment I'd like to make is um, for everyone up here as well as um, people in the audience, when you have a question or a comment, please state your name and your organization as well. Um, thank you. Uh, Perry Gottesfeld, Occupational Knowledge International. Uh, my question is regarding the uh, definition of motor vehicle in the uh, legislation. Uh, I was trying to clarify if that was uh, limited uh, to uh, standard cars or if that would include things like uh, two-wheelers and uh, uh, scooters and the like that are uh, motorized. Thank you. Um, that is a great question. Uh, I actually, in the reading of the bill, I'm not sure that they really clarified that, but I think that there is. Um, so the, the bill defines yes. um, motor vehicle as the same definition as section 415 of the vehicle code. Yes. 
and for anybody that is faster at typing than I am, um, to pull up that reference to the vehicle code, or we can get back um, answer that after the break. <laughs> Great question. Thanks. Any other items or questions? Yeah. Um, do you, would uh, Caroline Gold Committee PA? Do you want to talk about the role of UC Davis and yes. uh, what, what their functions are going to be? Certainly. So um, UC Davis has. Um, entered into an interagency agreement with Cal EPA, Cal Recycle, and DTSC, and they will be providing us with um, technical support in writing the report. So this in includes, they'll be taking meeting minutes for us. Um, they'll be preparing background material and doing research on items for future agendas that we will decide on collectively. Um, so if we decide on a certain topic for you know, next meeting's agenda, they will do research on that for us and prepare the background material. Um, and then again, as well, when we are putting together the final report, they will be um, assisting with that as well. Thank you. And did I get that right? Did I miss anything? No, good, perfect. Um, there's a thumbs up being made, so good. I pulled up the definition from the vehicle code. Sorry, Nick Lapis with Californians Against Waste. Uh, the definition is a motor vehicle is a vehicle that is self-propelled. So it would include all those. The only exception is wheelchairs and other uh, mobility devices. Great, thank you, Nick. Uh, so I guess we're dealing with more than just four-wheeled cars. <laughs> all right. Um, have there been any questions from the email? Any questions from the audience here? Okay. Right. Okay, so we can move forward then to discussing kind of the contents of the eventual report. So as we know, the mission of this advisory group is that after two and a half years of meetings, research, and discussion is that we will produce policy recommendations. Um, that will, again, and I, this is going to sound like a broken record, but we will help to guide the legislature in creating laws and policies that will aim to ensure that as close to 100% as possible of these lithium ion batteries that are in electric vehicles will be reused and recycled at their end of life in a safe and cost effective manner. So, all of our meetings that we're going to hold and the agenda items that we discuss must obviously encompass a uh, vast. Um, set of topics and um, these aspects of battery production, use, reuse, recycling, and eventual disposal. Um, some examples of items that we will get into in the report may include, um, you know, a discussion of the battery technology, uh, recycling methodologies, kind of the ones in existence, as well as perhaps future ones that may arise as we move forward in our meetings. Um, the global supply chain for battery components and materials this includes minerals and, you know, valuable raw materials. Um, the environmental impact of battery production and disposal, um, ways in which batteries may function as part of cleaner energy grids, as well as beneficial framework for how the public and private sectors may uh, collaborate with each other. Um, this is by no means an exhaustive list at all. and these topics and many, many more will need to be addressed in the report. Um, so again, we are very lucky to be able to draw upon the expertise of this advisory group, all of its members, as well as um, universities and research institutions in developing the report. And so I'm gonna open the panel up now for a discussion on these ideas or other ideas for items that um, you all may believe to be relevant to our work, not just today, and also to future meetings and um, deliverables that may need to be discussed. You're a very quiet group. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, but perhaps I'm going to, I don't try to pick on people in meetings, but perhaps um, if you were to list out the ideal content for you in this report or the one section that you would wish to see in this report, what would it be? And how about let's go down the line. So let's start with Lou over there and come forward to the right. If, 
if I understand you correctly, you're asking what recommendations we make for future agenda items, is that? <clears throat> no, so it would be, for example, if we're writing up the report today, um, what is one topic that you think must be addressed, for example? So obviously, um, we've got to look at the options for uh, reuse of the batteries. Um, we've got to look for options of potential recycling. Um, I think uh, hazmat is going to be a huge issue with regards to how we manage all of the uh, contaminants associated with lithium batteries, um, especially within the state of California, because that's a big issue. Um, so those would be three big agenda items that I think we need to focus on. I'm, I'm concerned, um, you know, two, two and a half years is not a long time to address what we have to address. This is a rather daunting um, subject. And is there any, uh, uh, if, if we're not able to come in with a recommendation within that time to the legislature, then what happens? Or is that a mandatory requirement that we have to do? It is certainly a goal um, to, to meet that deadline of the recommendations to the legislature. Um, as you say, it is a huge task. And yeah. just even in the issues that you identified there, that's a, that's a significant workload for this group, even in two years. You know, and I would say that what we should do throughout the, 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 the committee's work is to identify where we can make policy recommendations or where the policy recommendation is this needs further research, further resourcing, um, and to create the picture for the legislature on how that they should move forward in looking at this in this area moving forward, if that answers your question. Okay. So um, this is Bernie Cotlier from the Labor Management Cooperation Committee. So my concerns and our concerns as uh, an industry, I believe, have to do uh, not only with recycling, but as the legislation points out, reuse. Uh, second use, maybe even third use. And these issues are, are very much interrelated with um, production of greenhouse gases, release of toxic materials, and a lot of ancillary issues that we need to be concerned about. And um, it's my interest, and I believe the interest of the organizations that I represent, to maximize the reuse, second use, and um, ability to extend the life of these batteries. First of all, they create considerable greenhouse gases when they're manufactured. They use rare earth, earth materials, some of which are not only toxic, but are produced in um, very unfortunate circumstances around the world. Uh, so to the extent that we can minimize the production of batteries by uh, using them to their full capacity, including second and maybe even third use, uh, we are not only um, addressing the recycling issue ultimately, but we're addressing greenhouse gas issues and other critical issues. So I know that issue is fraught because I'm aware uh, through NatBat and our organization that automakers are very concerned about the liability. Uh, there's also the question of UL listing or, or uh, listing by testing agencies. And I think uh, it's gonna be a challenge to address those issues, but they're critical ones that we must address. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Nicewonder, I work in Household Hazardous Waste Field. Uh, one of the concerns that I have is potentially some of this material crossing over into household waste streams where we do see lithium ion batteries that come out of everyday products that people buy off the shelves, leave in their pantries, and eventually when they reach end of life, they come and drop them off at our facilities. Um, my understanding of it is that the lithium ion batteries in automobiles are just slightly larger capacity than your typical, say, cell phone battery. And they're strung into series and parallel so that you have a greater uh, storage capacity so that you can increase the vehicle miles traveled. So if the only thing holding these particular lithium ion batteries is the definition that they're coming from a motor vehicle, and a motor vehicle is just something that is self-propelled. What is, is there a protection to the rate payers that pay into these household hazardous waste facilities from shouldering the burden when they get downsized or clipped up into smaller sizes? Thank you, Jeff. 
Uh, so George Kirchner with PRBA, the Rechargeable Battery Association. I, I think for this group, um, I think um, for the legislature, sub legislators, I think we'd be doing everybody a big favor by narrowing the scope of this. Um, when I heard the definition of what a vehicle is, I'm thinking the scooters and skateboards and that's a, something that's self-propelled. I was under the impression that we were focusing on the four-wheel electric vehicles that we all know and love, right? So I think um, we'd be doing all our, everybody a favor by narrowing the scope of this, uh, of this advisory group, recommending to the legislature that they do that. And also particularly important when we get into developing our, our report to the legislature, um, helping them define what, who are the producers of these batteries. Because ultimately, when it comes to product stewardship and recycling and such, it, it gets a little fuzzy as to who that producer is, actually is. Um, and we're talking about secondary use and third use and so forth. Um, I think that's gonna be very complex. Um, so I think we'd be doing, um, again, the, the state a favor as well as the legislature if they go back and they're gonna revisit this and pass new legislation by helping them define those terms before they put pen to paper. Uh, but I think that would be a very critical part of this. Thank you. Terry Adams with SA Recycling. <clears throat> so a couple um, thoughts come to mind um, that need to be dealt with. Um, one is the, uh, the safety aspect of removing vehicles from batteries going from 12 volt systems to uh, systems running in the you know 300 to 800 volt range uh, requires um, again some extreme safety issues that need to be dealt with that aren't normally dealt with in the auto dismantling um, cycle the cost of recycling um, as the you know the intrinsic value of batteries uh, are driven down um, you know, somebody needs to be able to be responsible for for those costs as a uh, as the recycling cost may exceed the value of the battery, and you know when when car when batteries are in cars, uh, it's easy to trace back to um, you know an ownership either of that car whether it goes back to the manufacturer or the you know, the owner of that car, but when you go into a second life scenario, it breaks that chain and, and now you have, you know, batteries that, that have maybe no, no responsible party uh, from, you know, from the original owner of those batteries. So, so I think that needs to be dealt with at some point. Thank you, Terry. <clears throat> Hi, uh, <clears throat> Todd Coy with KVI. Uh, I agree with the gentleman at the end that two and a half years uh, is not a long time to uh, take on the task that is in front of me. So through uh, agreement with Mr. Kirchner, I also think that there should be a scope, uh, not a limitation, but uh, a focus perhaps, uh, because the world of mobility uh, is a fairly large one. And I think it's important that the we don't suffer from project creep, as it as it says, and take on every uh, take on everything. Uh, <clears throat> that also being said, that uh, you know, it very well may be that because the dynamic of the market is changing, and uh, <clears throat> that the report may just end up being, hey, look, there is still an evolutionary uh, <clears throat> circumstance that is occurring out in, in the state of California. Uh, and it may be that the uh, the burden isn't necessarily to make recommendation, recommendations on legislation, but to make the right recommendations moving forward. Uh, that being said, uh, there is also some, you know, other extraneous regulations that impact, especially when you look at activities within the state, how it may impact whether or not it's recycling in the state of California or other activities in the state of California that may be precluded because of other, regula other regulations that are currently in existence, such as hazardous waste treatment as it pertains to recycling. So I think it's important to note as we, uh, as we move forward and, and address various uh, issues that are faced in the industry that it, it's not done in, I don't wanna say a vacuum or, or a bubble, but that there are other influencing factors that impact second use, uh, whether or not that is uh, UN testing criteria for battery safety and as you take apart batteries and put them back together. So there's a, a, a wide range of areas that impact 
uh, virtually every topic that may be addressed in, in this committee. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. <clears throat> Uh, Jennifer Krill, Earthworks and Plug in America. Uh, my interests are in um, kind of three categories, producer responsibility, both now at the product design level. I mean, considering a half a million electric vehicles today is um, a, a lot. I mean, in two years doesn't seem like a lot of time, but on the other hand, a half a million out of 15 million we're also kind of at the beginning of an industry and we um, can encourage um, design so that recyclability can be maximized. Um, material recovery maximization so as to minimize the, um, the impacts that could be quite adverse from mining and manufacturing. And then um, third, to uh, minimize toxicity to ensure protection for workers and communities. Those are my interests. Thank you, Jennifer. Yes, uh, Perry Gottesfeld, Occupational Knowledge International. Um, one, one thing I see a need for already from uh, this early discussion uh, would be the need for some definitions. Um, I think, you know, we normally think of recycling, we think of uh, taking a newspaper and making pulp out of that and making a new paper product out of that. And uh, when we talk about lithium ion batteries, I don't think we're quite there yet. And uh, we've also heard discussion about uh, what might be called refurbishment or reuse. Uh, and I think we, we need to all be clear on how we want to go forward and use those terms and um, be clear from the start that uh, is our intent. Uh, also, I think uh, it's very important that we look at uh, both the uh, smaller vehicles as well as the larger vehicles. Ultimately, the uh, use of those might uh, surpass the waste stream for larger vehicles. If we start thinking about they may have a shorter lifespan, their batteries might be you know, subject to more abuse, and so, uh, and, and we might see cheaper batteries used for those lesser products, so I think we need to uh, focus on all such uh, batteries. I do think, though, that uh, we do need to also consider various uh, chemistries for lithium-ion batteries, because we know they're not all uh, alike, and they all have implications in terms of uh, end of life. And uh, certainly, uh, we should look at um, the uh, producer responsibilities and uh, both uh, how that would uh, transpire and looking at other models that have been in, in use uh, for other kinds of legislation here in California and elsewhere. And uh, one suggestion might be to uh, bring in some experts who've uh, done a lot of work on this uh, issue, and I know there's a group in, uh, I think it's Argonne National Laboratories that's looked at this issue, and it might be uh, good to get them on early on to uh, assess where we're at with recycling today and to use that to uh, further our discussions going forward. Thank you. All right, thank you, Barry. Ana Maria Stoyancho, Cal Recycle. Um, I'm particularly interested in exploring policy options that might be financial mechanism, incentives, various producer responsibility models or take-back schemes that are aimed at um, ensuring a robust collection and processing infrastructure in California so that consumers have convenient places to um, uh, discard their um, old batteries, EV batteries. Um, and also, as it has been uh, mentioned before, I think it's critical to um, have a holistic approach, looking not only at the end of life, but also at product design. Thank you, Anna Maria. Hi, Alison Linder. Um, I, I think my interest would be in kind of two general areas. One would be, I guess, the design and manufacturing, and thinking of ways to create um, batteries that are kind of minimal impact in their design as far as use of extractive materials, looking for opportunities for um, interchangeability of parts, reuse of parts, maybe some type of modular design. 
or um, some kind of across the board standardization that increases the opportunity for changing out components um, and of course providing consumers more options. You know, you don't wanna have to buy one type of thing and only be restricted to that system, but some kind of uh, standardization or um, like, like uh, Anne-Marie said, holistic approach to the design. Um, and also, I guess, looking into some of the policy levers, how can we encourage this? Um, you know, what are the barriers to recycling? And I guess also I would just say by recycling, I, I hope that the committee would expand the definition to include all means of reuse. I know there's a lot of other, um, you know, I don't think we need to go strictly to that, let's grind it up and into pulp. You know, we wanna think of how can we use this existing product in other ways? Um, most effectively. And um, I guess thinking about, in terms of the policy, how can um, this provide a great opportunity for economic development within California? Um, so, you know, kind of making sure we have the expertise to do this type of battery reuse and recycling within the state. Um, looking into markets for reuse and the pricing and um, also, I guess, ensuring that California is leading the way, not just within the state, but nationally. You know, California has a history of being progressive and forward thinking with environmental policies. So um, whatever we, I guess this kind of goes back to my earlier comment about standardization, but the kind of policy recommendations we create here should be um, expandable and scalable beyond California. Thank you. Dan Bowers with the Auto Alliance. So um, as was just mentioned, looking at reuse because there's a tremendous amount of value in the battery before it actually gets recycled. And to that point, how we follow the liability and chain of custody once that battery comes out of a vehicle. Um, obviously the, the auto manufacturer at that point would not understand where that battery is going to be used and there'd have to be some sort of certification or something before that battery could go into uh, power distribution or whatever that may be. So. How do you follow that uh, in second use and then third and uh, eventually to recycle? Um, I think Lou mentioned transportation issues. I think that's uh, a big thing that we should look at as well. Um, you know, the de defining these batteries, depending on what state they are, as hazmat or whatever they may be, uh, potentially adds cost to the recycling portion of it that uh, we need to make sure we're taking into account. And as was also just mentioned, uh, obviously this group is focused on California, but policies start in California and then kind of spread. So. Um, having an opportunity to develop these that could be adopted throughout uh, the, the nation and other states um, should certainly be, be in our purview. Thank you, Dan. This is John Wiseman from Tesla. Uh, I agree with uh, most of the proposals for different sections in a potential report. One that I would add is really on how would we incentivize battery recycling uh, development in California. Um, I, I really like the background information that was sent out for this meeting, but one of the barriers that's listed uh, says recycling is not cost feasible at scale. Um, I'd like to challenge that. I think that um, if you do uh, really develop uh, efficient battery reclamation technology, and I'm talking about you know, the actual metals reclamation, not necessarily the reuse, um, if you optimize the recovery of all materials, not just nickel and cobalt, but also aluminum, copper, steel, um, and do that efficiently and at scale, um, you know, that it can be cost effective. And that's really what's gonna promote uh, really high recycling rates is if the batteries can be recycled uh, for, me for metals reclamation profitably. If it's, uh, if it's cost prohibitive, then uh, we're really fighting an uphill battle. If you were to try to set up a battery recycling plant in California today, it would be very difficult, and the technology doesn't necessarily exist to do it profitably. Um, so I think we should really look at, um, you know, is, do we want battery recycling to take place in California? Um, and if so, what would be required to do so? Uh, and how can we minimize some of those barriers as well? Thank you, John. I'm hoping we, uh, as a result of this process, come forward with a pretty solid legislative proposal uh, for both producer responsibility for these batteries um, and any complementary policy changes that we need. Um, ha having proposed 
many different bills over the years on uh, uh, producer responsibility for various products. This is the first time that I can think of that an industry has come in and said, well, can we please study this? And everyone said, okay. And if we sort of then in two years don't have a solution, I think um, it'll be wasted time. And if we can come together with a comprehensive proposal, and there are a lot of different ways to handle this, whether it's you know the e-waste e model, the lead acid battery model, um, there are many other models as well. And so I'm hoping we'll be able to introduce a bill day after the report's uh, done. Thank you, Nick. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for those comments. I'm just going to furiously taking notes, and it, and it seems like the for the report, there's kind of a couple of big buckets that we're looking at. First of all, is the definitional piece. You know, what is it we're talking about? Um, you know, what do we mean by recycling, second use? And we need to be very clear on those issues as we go forward. Um, and you know, who is the producer that we're talking about for these materials? What does that look like? And then it seems that many people are talking about producer responsibility, both from the aspect of if we are looking at a producer responsibility model, what does that mean for liability? Who, you know, what does it mean if we're looking to reuse? Who is responsible there? What does that model look like? And then the third piece is around uh, what are the economic incentives, the development of recycling infrastructure, and obviously that's a, a huge issue across many. Uh, it's, it's not just for this group, but it's it's. Uh, many recycling, reuse, second use issues. How do we look at that? So it seems that those are going to be the three kind of th themes um, that just kind of came out from everyone's presentations. And obviously, this is not the first time we will talk about this, but there's certainly food for thought on what we might be driving towards and working towards. Um, and, and again, I'm very conscious that two years is really not a very long time to do all of this work. So, um, and with that, was anybody. Any members of the public um, have any questions or, co or comments on this topic? And do we have any uh, emailed questions? No? OK. Uh, so with that, um, we are um, we're doing very well on time. Um, despite that clock, it is actually uh, 10 past 2. Uh, so, uh, so let's go ahead and take a break. Um, and if we can get back here promptly at to 40 because I can do math on the fly um, and uh, yeah uh, and there's if any, there is a small cafeteria downstairs if anybody wants to get a drink or anything downstairs right, thank you Great, thank you everyone. It's very punctual, which is appreciated. So we're gonna move on to uh, item number seven on the report. And I'm gonna just seed some thought for the committee members on, on things to talk about. So obviously we just had a discussion on the, uh, the what the report contents would look like. And we're obviously gonna keep coming back to that um, in the coming months and over the course of the two years. Um, and now I'd just like to, before I hand over to Mohammed, just to kind of give some, poise some questions to you. Um, so in for future meetings, are there any particular researchers that you would recommend uh, we bring in to hear from? Uh, any particular topics that we should uh, bring in folks to talk about? Um, is there anywhere where it would be good uh, to visit? Um, and there will, will be constraints on uh, visits, uh, as obviously this is a Bagley Keen body. Um, my, I have a generally pretty fixed rule that you don't get to volunteer somebody else's time. So um, if there is something that you can control or that you think you could help to arrange. Um, and also then, just how you would like the discussions to be structured um, outside of those two issues. If there's anything else that you think uh, we should be looking at. So I'm going to hand over to Mohammed for this. Yeah, so this is um, just an open forum, really. And um, I'm just going to allow for, you know, members of the um, advisory group here, uh, as well as folks in the audience um, and folks who are viewing online, um, like we said, or like Carolyn said, to um, to just bring up topics that have not been brought up before, site visits, um, prominent 
you know, or not so prominent researchers or institutions or anything like that that might be worth um, inviting to speak or provide material for us, um, any sort of site visits um, elsewhere. I know a lot of individuals here are from um, industries in which they have facilities that directly deal with, um, you know, EV batteries and if it might be pertinent for members of the committee to have their uh, to have a meeting there to also see what is on the ground as well. So I'll open this up now. So I'd be interested in, uh, this is Lou Ramondetta with uh, Surplus Service. I'd be interested in learning more about um, battery. Uh, from what I understand from these batteries, they have about an 80% uh, or they have about a 10 year, eight to 10 year capacity. And then once they're depleted, uh, they're not really replete, depleted. There's still about 80% life left in the battery. So I'd be interested in maybe hearing from an expert or somebody who can speak to, is there any options out there that might uh, be viable to extending the life of the battery and or allowing the battery to be used below that 80% um, percentage? Because that would obviously extend out uh, the battery life as well as extending out uh, or, or allowing you know more more charge to be used off of the battery. So I'd be interested in that. The other thing I'd be interested in is um, someone who can talk to us about chemistry and breakdown of the batteries from a hazmat perspective and from a materials perspective and what um, what are going to be the viable options once a battery is broken down because this is all going to come down to some sort of an economic model and whether it's economically feasible to actually recycle these batteries and unless we understand whether that is a viable option and you know what's going to come out and if there's any value associated with it it's going to be very, very difficult to make a decision from an advisory perspective great thank you and sorry did you mention uh, for your first uh, question did you have a recommendation of who that might be i do not know okay. Um, but perhaps uh, some of the other um, com committee members or um, some of our friends from UC Davis have recommendations on that. Um, perhaps they could speak to that right now or at a later time. Is that something? Uh, Perry? Um, well, I've, I already mentioned earlier that it might be uh, good to involve the group from Argonne National Laboratories that's um, done a lot of research in this arena and particularly on um, the recycling feasibility aspects for various uh, lithium ion chemistries. Um, and I think the other uh, place that might be useful to look are what other uh, models exist for uh, life cycle uh, regulation, if you will, or producer responsibility regulation for lithium ion batteries in other jurisdictions like Europe and uh, how, how do those operate and uh, to, to look at uh, possible models that might be out there outside of lithium ion battery recycling. Dan Bowers with the Auto Alliance. I agree. I think Argon would be a great one um, in conjunction with, or even maybe instead, Department of Energy, who's doing a lot of the a lot of the funding for Argon, the resale center, and also doing the battery recycling prize and a lot of funding going into this area, not just on the recycling, but also looking at the chemistry of the batteries. So you might be able to get them to come in and kind of answer a few of our questions. And um, is that could I follow up with you to maybe set up mm -hmm. a contact to, to yeah, talk absolutely. about? Thank yeah. you. Uh, anyone in the audience who has anything to say or have we gotten any further emails? I think there was one email though. There was one email from Daryl De La Cruz who was an electric vehicle enthusiast. I'm um, sorry, can you uh, speak up just a little bit more? Yes, a question from Daryl De, De La Cruz, an electric vehicle enthusiast. His question is, um, seems like we need an advisor to the board that has a history of industrial scale experience with the mechanics of refurbishing and dismantling all forms of batteries and the cost. Perhaps interstate battery Johnson controls and also do not forget to include flying transportation batteries as a side note with scooters. Okay. Thank you.
any others? John, do you? Yeah, I would just say um, it, it would really be good to get an academic view on uh, battery degradation and uh, the mechanics behind battery degradation. Uh, there's a lot of talk about secondary use for batteries, which, while sounds really good in terms of extending usable life, um, based on the research done at Tesla, there's a phenomenon where there's like nonlinear degradation of a battery. So once you get beyond like 50% of the usable life, the battery degrades much more quickly. Um, so you could be talking about you know secondary life for uh, utility storage and whatnot, but um, you could have like a potentially uh, very short life battery. So I would recommend, um, you know, Tesla has a lot of research. I don't necessarily know that we have uh, the capacity to, you know, commit one of our battery engineers, but, um, you know, some sort of academic lab uh, that understands battery degradation very well, and I can look into this, ask our battery researchers. But um, I think we really need to understand the fundamentals of degradation of the lithium ion battery. Thank you, John. Um, and then something Carolyn mentioned was also uh, the possibility of other um, venues that, you know, under Bagley Keene, we could meet at. Um, does anyone have any ideas that would also be, you know, feasible, um, as in driving distance, perhaps of Sacramento, or something to that effect? <clears throat> Uh, this, uh, this is John from Tesla. Um, I think it would be worth visiting a battery recycler, um, an actual lithium ion battery recycler. Um, I don't know of any within driving distance of here, but um, we could also maybe watch some videos or whatnot. Um, the other, another type of facility that I recommend visiting is like a, an auto recycler. Um, I would anticipate that a lot of electric vehicles will end up going to some sort of auto recycler at end of life. Um, so seeing what is actually happening uh, with those EV batteries or even hybrid batteries would be a good example today and to even discuss with those auto recyclers, you know, uh, what they're seeing in the field and what they think might be workable. So hopefully there might be an auto recycler type junkyard in the, in the vicinity. Thank you. So, so I can certainly speak to the, you know, auto recycling side of it and car shredding, you know, business. There, there are two shredders here in Northern California. Um, the shredders we have are all in Southern California, so that probably is going to be way outside your your driving range, but um, certainly um, could probably be uh, arranged. Um, but you know, one thing I think is important for at some point we we you know the group has to get a handle on in terms of you know what is what is um, uh, you know the, the world of recycling of, of lithium ion batteries. What what can be done? What are what are you know what is economically feasible? And uh, I mean, like most things, you know, the, the you can recycle 100% of the battery if if you want. There's just a cost associated, you know, with it. Uh, and so, um, you know, understanding you know what can and can't be done at, at this point in time, and what is as well as what is currently being done in terms of the recovery of you know materials like lithium and cobalt and, and nickel, I think would be helpful for the group to understand the current state. Thank you, Terry. Uh, Bernie Cotlier with the uh, Labor Management Cooperation Committee. So uh, in terms of expertise, uh, in addition to Argonne that was mentioned, uh, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Colorado has DOE-funded research that's ongoing on the second use of batteries, and they have a test bed um, partnership with UC San Diego. Thank you, Bernie. I believe, um, uh, and some of the folks here may know better, but I believe uh, Schnitzer Steel does a significant amount of, of recycling. Uh, we have a relationship with them, so if it was of interest, I could try to talk with them and see if they might be amenable to having us come in to tour one of their facilities and see what they do from a shredding perspective. Thanks, Lou. <coughs> Uh, I think um, as far as other background information, maybe an understanding of what other, um, or how this issue has been handled in other products that use similar components. Thank you, Allison.
Um, so I, it sounds like there is certainly an interest from the group in having some foundational presentations for our early meetings around, um, it, it's almost speaking to the, the, the foundational definitions, but then also the, the discussion of what does it look like right now, who is doing what, what are the, um, what are the, the basic chemistry aspects of this and what are other jurisdictions doing? And that's certainly something that we can, can look into um, getting onto the agenda. I would say, I think, um, certainly open to going beyond um, driving distance of Sacramento. Um, to, as long as, you know, as, as we move to getting the, uh, the calendar mapped out, um, so we all have plenty of time to plan travel um, and to work within everybody's constraints of life to, to, to try and see if we can get out of Sacramento just a little bit. Um, and again, um, if you have any um, suggestions or any contacts that would be great that we can start to follow up with to get some presentations lined up uh, for our work next year, um, that would be really great. So. Uh, Perry Gottesfeld, just to follow up on the, our representative from Tesla's suggestions on field trips, I, since we're looking at the life cycle of the lithium ion battery, it might be interesting to see the manufacturing facility in Nevada that uh, Tesla has. This is John from Tesla. I can't make any commitments, but um, you know, actually some of the members from the DTSC and Calver Cycle have visited, but um, we'll see what we can do. And Thank you. Uh, that will require a little bit more finessing from the state side for out-of-state travel. Um, <laughs> but uh, thank you. I appreciate that. And again, with enough advance notice, we can certainly make that happen. Okay. Um, thank you all. Um, at this point, oh, yes, uh, E.C. Davis. Um, let me, there are some mics over there. I'll, um, All right, uh, we just wanted to suggest there's a repurposed lab at UC Davis where electric vehicle retired batteries are being repurposed for second life uses. Um, that might be a good local visit to do. Um, and we'd be happy to facilitate connections with national labs and even with the UCSD test bed as well, if that helps. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, um, at this time, um, we're really just going to uh, begin addressing questions from the public who have joined us today. Um, so this is not only everyone sitting here, but also those who are watching via our live stream. Um, and again, if you are watching via live stream, um, please send your questions in the form of an email uh, along with uh, your name. And if you are representing an organization, then the name of that organization to auditorium at calepa.ca.gov. Um, and one thing I would like to kind of emphasize is that the advisory group cannot make decisions on items that were not already on the agenda, um, but we may decide to incorporate some of those um, items uh, for future meetings. Um, I'm going to walk down and get a microphone and you know, if anyone has questions, please raise your hand. And not just questions, but also comments or even just what brought you here today. Thank you. Just a, a quick show of hands. Does who, who might have comments or questions or? Hi, this is uh, Micah with the California Energy Commission, uh, Micah Wofford. Just a comment, uh, I wanna suggest that any policy recommendations that this group would make would uh, also consider disadvantaged communities and low-income communities in California. Much of the work being done at the California Energy Commission and other agencies in the state, specifically in the transportation electrification sector, is going to have a huge impact on these types of communities. And uh, EV battery recycling is no exception. Whether we are talking, uh, talking about second use applications, sustainable manufacturing processes, or optimized recycling and reclamation methodologies, there's a great economic opportunity for communities of all sizes and demographics in California. Thank you. Thank you. 
Are there any other questions or comments? Have we gotten any um, emails? Okay. Well, we anticipate a lot more in future meetings. Uh, so as Mohammed's making his way back up, so we're, we're next, uh, now going to look at the, um, the tentative agenda for uh, the tentative meeting dates for next year. Um, our goal is to get these uh, locked in um, so we can all plan our calendars around. I know many of you have travelled to be here today. Um, and again, just keep in mind if, if you know there is a site to host that's not here, um, how that might uh, fit into the agenda for next year. Great. So, um, you know, I've spoken to a lot of you up here about um, kind of the tentative meeting dates for 2020. Um, and so I'll just, as a recap, we really have to, we have to meet at least quarterly until uh, April 1st, 2022, as, as stipulated in the um, bill, that is AB 2032. Um, but, you know, a lot of you have flown to be here today. A lot of you have... Um, made sacrifices to come out and we really appreciate that and so we'd like to ensure as carolyn said that um, meeting dates and times are planned finalized and also publicly noticed so people can attend um, well in advance so there are four tentatively planned meetings for 2020 um, and those dates are as follows so monday january 27th 2020 monday april 20th 2020 Monday, July 20th, 2020, and Monday, October 19th, 2020. You'll notice that I said Monday a lot. Um, that date is not set in stone by any means. It's um, just a consideration of what might be most, um, you know, uh, convenient for you all as far as travel. Um, we also recognize that not everyone plans their calendars out a full year in advance. Um, but at least it is necessary to provide these dates ahead of time so that you can um, plan around them accordingly. <clears throat> um, so also as far as future agenda items, uh, which will in includes many of the topics that we have brought up um, today, um, you know, as stated under Bagley Keene, we can only really discuss and make decisions on items that are on the agendas. So if you have, um, you know, ideas about what we want to discuss at, you know, the meeting in January or in April or et cetera, this needs to be planned out ahead of time. That also includes if we were to bring in an outside expert to present or if we were to go to another facility or um, location. Again, this all needs to be um, planned in advance. So uh, at this time, I'm gonna open the floor up to the advisory group members because um, we recognize that a lot of you, and in my discussions with some of you, certain dates came up that may, may not have been as convenient. Um, so I'd like to open the floor up for some optimal dates or dates we can arrange around. Um, and so again, just two points before we get into that is, again, there's no mandatory day of the week. And I would prioritize the next two meetings. So that's January 27th and April 20th, um, because the other ones are in July and October. So a little further out. Thanks. Could you repeat the last date that you said? Um, the last 127, 420, 730, and what's the last and, one? Uh, October 19th. And just to clarify, Nick, it was July. Uh, it was July twentieth. So I guess I would ask again. This is Lou with Plus Service. If um, there are any other options other than Mondays, Mondays tend to be horrendous days for me. Um, if we could look at maybe Tuesdays or Thursdays, um, it might be a better option. I don't know how the other folks on the group feel about that. Sure. Thanks, Lou. Um, yeah, like I said, you know, any day of the week is a possibility. It just kind of depends on what people's availability is. And certainly we don't want to inconvenience you too much by you know, always asking for difficult days. Um, 
I think, uh, Terry, you had an issue with the January 27th date. Was that correct? Th that is correct. I'm out for a couple weeks out of the country. And when did you say you'd be back? I think you're looking at. I, I return um, on uh, January 31st or the February 1st, I guess. So the following, anytime the following week uh, okay. would work. And um, Jennifer, I think uh, when you and I talked, um, you mentioned that uh, the April date is around Earth Day. The button might be more difficult. Is that correct? Correct. I yes. don't have a plan yet for Earth Day, mm -hmm. but I usually do. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so are any of the other um, uh, advisory group members who are here today have issues with um, the uh, first two dates, uh, January 27th or April 20th? Um, do people have, oh, George. <clears throat> so on the on April 20th, I'll be in Asia for for that week. So okay. um, if, if since I'm headed out this way, if you want to make it the week before, just <laughs> carry that over, and I'll just fly from here to, to Japan. Okay. Thank you, George. I will also um, be in Asia uh, during that week. Okay. Everyone has more fun travel plans than I do. Yeah. So we have um, perhaps uh, a suggestion for um, delaying the Monday, January 27th date to perhaps the week after. Um, and uh, the April 20th date, uh, perhaps the week before. Does that sound accurate? Am I hearing that correctly? Okay, I'm gonna take that silence as a yes. So, um, okay, we will uh, look at other dates that might fit and uh, circulate those around and see what everyone can make. And uh, it, if we were to say pick Tuesdays, is, does anyone, are, are Tuesdays particularly bad for anybody? Depends which one. <laughs> 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 I have some standing stuff like the, typically the second um, Tuesday of uh, every month. So besides Mondays, are we hearing of any days that are bad for anybody, just in general? Okay, great. Thank you. So I'm going to um, summarize kind of the meeting and um, what we discussed today. So we first were all introduced um, to the members of the advisory group, not only to each other, but to the public. Um, we learned about the goals of the advisory group and w the bill that brought it into fruition. Um, Salwa gave us an excellent uh, presentation about the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act, so thank you. Um, we went over the roles and expectations for the advisory group members, as well as for members of the public who may be joining us and listening in. Um, we discussed the bill, uh, we learned more about the landscape of battery reuse and recycling. Um, we discussed the contents of the eventual report. Uh, we also um, kind of identified key areas in which we would like either further uh, clarification, direction, or more research to be done as part of our work moving forward. Um, we fielded questions, comments, and suggestions from members of the public. And um, I believe that that is what we accomplished today. Am I missing anything? So um, I'd now like to ask our Vice Group Chair, Deputy Secretary Godkin, to formally adjourn this meeting. Uh, so thank you, everybody. I appreciate everyone coming today. Um, and um, 
I suspect this will be one of the few times we adjourn early, um, as we have a lot to get to in the coming two years. So, um, you know, we've got a lot uh, of content that we're going to be working on building in terms of presentations, research information, and potentially also some site visits for us um, as we move through our work in the coming years. So, first up, thank you to everybody who came today. It is appreciated and certainly appreciate your interest in applying to be on this committee and work going forward. Uh, thank you to, uh, to UT Davis. We look forward to working with you. Uh, thanks also, I was remiss in calling out Emily, who's from Cal Recycle, who's uh, been taking notes. So thank you for that. And to Mohammed and Teresa, who's not here today for putting together. So um, with that, um, thank you, everybody. And the meeting's adjourned.